The lousy old office was cold and reeked of sorrow. It was always so goddamn dark, even with light on. It had been four hours since Chris introduced Michael to the world of scary pasta. They read a few stories, trying to become better acquainted with the subject matter and its scribblers. Most of the scribblers seemed to be young, creative people who just wanted the world to catch a glimpse into their souls. Slowly but surely, Michael was becoming a fan. Chris was already familiar with the main characters from the most popular stories. He played narrated scary pastas on YouTube for Michael, and they went that route for a while in order to allow their eyes to rest. Connor would have loved this stuff, Chris said with a slight smile, recalling how Connor loved horror movies and writing short stories. Chris enjoyed reading his stories. He wondered for a moment if his son had indeed discovered the world of scary pasta at some point. Michael looked at Chris for a moment, ready to listen, like a good friend. He didn't quite know what to say. He couldn't imagine the pain Chris felt. He had experienced the worst pain a person can feel. Yet, here he was, still fighting crime, catching criminals of the worst kind, murderers, rapists, child killers. Each scumbag he took off the street was like a fix, just enough to get him through another few days, like a junkie in their heroin. Criminals were everywhere. Throw a rock into a room and you'd likely hit more than a few. No doubt this city was going to hell in a handbasket. That's why you needed family, if you had them. Your own personal Jesus. Chris lost his to this cruel city two years ago. They searched for anything new posted in the hours since Mr. Von Drack's death. All they needed was a clue, something, anything to go on. Their search turned up empty. Chris searched for one more story. He typed in, Satanists. A title popped up, Summer in Texas, written by Sarah Metal Massacre. He felt something stir inside. He began to read the story. Ten minutes into the story, it hit him like a kick in the nuts. Son of a bitch. What? You find something? Michael looked up from his computer screen. Yeah. This story I'm reading. It's called Summer in Texas. It's written by someone from my old days in Lytle, when I was with the sheriff's department, Chris explained. Michael was now intrigued. No shit, Chris began to explain. Yeah, about 15 years ago, I had been a deputy for about two years. It was right before Abby and me were married. Yeah, that's right. What was his name? Allen? Michael interrupted. Yeah, Bobby Allen. Is he still around? Yeah, he still lives in Lytle. He retired after a heart attack. It's a wonder he didn't go too when Abby and Connor passed, Michael said, staring at the wall. You ever go and see him? Michael began to pry. No, I haven't been back since the funeral. He calls once in a while to check in on me. He invites me out, but... Look, let's get back to the story, 
You're raising my Irish here, Mikey. Chris was now clearly annoyed. Michael smiled and nodded, apologizing. Sorry, man. Go on. As I was saying, 15 years ago, we get a report from two local kids, Joey Mayer and Jason Pruitt. They were just kids, 12 or 13. A new family have moved in to an old abandoned house up on the East Prairie Street. Everyone called it Dead Man's Curve due to the high number of automobile fatalities over the years. It led up to a large hill where the family in question moved. They had this daughter, 12 years old, and from the get-go there was something off about them. They dressed in raggedy old clothes that looked straight from the turn of the century. The boys came to the station one day claiming that they had made friends with the girl, and that morning she had bruises all over her arms. They asked us to check it out. Well, after heading up there, we questioned them, asked if we could see their daughter. They claimed they had no daughter, just an infant son who died shortly after birth. We asked to search the premises. They refused without a warrant. When we went back to inform the boys, they said that the girl, Sarah, claimed she had an older brother named uh, Jimmy Lee that lived there with them. That's the name the couple gave for the deceased infant. We went for the warrant immediately. Meanwhile, one of the boys had developed some sort of romantic relationship with Sarah. Joey, I think it was, the chubby one. They had taken it upon themselves to try and rescue her. Their plan was simple. One hid behind the trash cans, while the other threw rocks at the window and shouted from the driveway. As the couple went outside to confront and give chase, the one hiding, Joey, would go in and rescue Sarah. It didn't quite pan out that way. We got there just in the nick. They were chasing the boys down the driveway, butcher knives in hand. We told them to stop. When they refused, we shot them dead, then and there. I went inside to check on Sarah. She had been hog-tied and gagged, laying on a black tarp. The parents had dug up a corpse from the cemetery and sat it in a chair. A satanic Bible was on the sofa. The parents had belonged to some backwoods satanic cult in Travis County and had fled after some trouble there. They were planning to sacrifice the girl. Turned out, after an investigation, they had kidnapped her as a baby and murdered her birth parents and raised her. She got treatment, adjusted, was introduced into society, and now, apparently writing. And from what I've read, she's quite good at it, too. She is one of the most popular writers on scarypasta.com. All of her stories are narrated on YouTube. Small world, huh? Wow, man. Small world indeed. Michael responded with a surprised look. He thought for a moment, then looked up at Chris. Hey, do you know if she's local now? Maybe she can give some insight on finding the killer. Like a consultant, he suggested. Chris stared at Michael for a moment, then looked off to the right. I don't know, but that's a damn good idea. Glad I thought of it. Well, what are we waiting for? Michael asked with the excitement of a child. I think she goes by another name now. I can't remember what, though. Damn it. My father-in-law would know. She moved back a little while after that. Lived with a foster family who eventually adopted her. 
we were gone by then. We got married, and I got the job with SAPD. Guess I'll call him up. Here, why don't you get familiar with it while I call Bobby? Chris said hesitantly, not wanting to face the ghosts of the past. Bobby Allen was the one person Chris couldn't face. He was more than ashamed. Chris wasn't worthy of facing his mentor. He gave her away at their wedding. He trusted Chris with his daughter's life, and he failed him. Now he was minus a daughter and a grandson. He knew Bobby was hurting. He looked up at the ceiling and shook his head, saying, You're killing me softly here. Michael took the hint and stood up from his chair. Let me go to the can, grab some coffee. You want anything? Chris searched through his address book on his cell and briefly looked up at Michael. No thanks, I'm good. With that, Michael took his leave and closed the office door behind him. It was the courteous thing to do, and Michael was raised right. He thought for a moment about how difficult this call would be for his partner and friend. Chris was damaged, but still a good friend and a good cop. He knew that Chris had his demons to chase. It was likely a chase that would never end. Not until somebody popped him and stabbed him in his tracks. Or unless he offed himself. He would likely feel the same way if he were in his shoes. But who knows, right? It was Mike Tyson that said, Everyone has a plan until they get hit. Bobby. Hello? Chris. Hello, Bobby. Chris. Is that you, son? Yeah, it's me. Been a while, I know. Yes, sir. It sure has. How are you, kid? Uh, I'm getting by. Still fighting the good fight, you know. And you? Well, I'm doing okay. Just trying to keep busy around here. Mona always has something for me to do. <laughs> That's good. Now, Chris, is this a social call? You coming out to Lytle? Mona would be real glad to see you, son. So would I. I'd like that, Bobby. But, uh... Listen, uh, you remember Sarah Campbell? Sarah? Yeah, I do. She goes by the name Chloe Marks now. The Markses adopted her. She lives in downtown San Antonio, last I heard. Why? What's going on? It's a long story. I'm trying to locate her. I'm thinking I can use her as a consultant in a case I'm working on. So far, no real leads in the case. Huh. Well, she visits her folks from time to time. Haven't seen her in a while, though. Last I heard, she was writing. I must say, you got my curiosity piqued now. No kidding. Well, it's a homicide done in a ritualistic manner. The Vic had a web address carved into his forearm. It's to a horror fiction website where writers post their stories. The killer recreated a popular story from the site when he murdered the Vic. Funny thing about it is, in researching various stories on the website for any leads, I came across a story written by Sarah Metal Massacre a story that tells of her case. 
written in the third person. She even has us in it. Names slightly altered, of course. But it's us, Bobby. It has to be her. You said she's a writer. Well, there you go. Well, I'll be damned. I think I'd like to take a look for myself. What website is this? Scarypasta.com What? <laughs> Scarypasta.com? What's the name of the story? Summer in Texas. I'm writing it down. Summer in Texas. Scarypasta.com Okay, thanks. And hey, Chris. I meant it when I said we'd love to see you. You're our family. Open invitation. Thanks, Bobby. I just might take you up on that. It's real good to talk to you again. Thanks again for your help. Anytime, kid. Take care. Bye. We'll see ya, son. Michael opened the office after a nice long break. Chris greeted him as he opened the door with, Okay, got it. The name she goes by now is Chloe Marks. She lives here in San Antonio, downtown of all places. Michael looked at Chris and nodded his head. Well, that's a start. Let's check it out. Already did the background check on her. She lives a few blocks away from me on South Flores. That old building that's supposed to be really haunted, said Chris. He now showed a glimpse of that old spark, just for a second. Every building in downtown San Antonio is haunted. You ever been on one of those ghost tours? They're actually pretty fun, Michael said, remembering how much he and Carol and the kids enjoyed it when they went. Yeah, once, when Connor was 11. He liked all that stuff, Chris answered, trying his best not to go to that dark place. That was private. He did that shit alone, with a bottle and a 45. Michael stared at him, regretting his question. He broke through the awkwardness with, Yeah, well, no time like the present, right? Whose car are we taking? Chris quickly snapped out of his stupor and smirked at Michael, saying, Miss Sunshine, my friend. Miss Black motherfucking Sunshine. With that, the storm was calm for the moment, and all was well again. The snow was making a comeback all around San Antonio. The dark and downtown streets were near empty. The whole city acted like it was Armageddon outside every time there was the slightest sign of a freeze, much less snow. Miss Sunshine's roar echoed throughout every block she passed. Chris used to treat her with kindness and respect. Now, he liked to take chances with her. Sometimes, he actually raced some of the street punks with their Hondas and Mitsubishis. It was all for the thrill. He liked feeling something again, something other than the constant pain that resided within his soul. As they turned on South Flores, the street was illuminated by old rustic street lamps. Down a dark alleyway, a fire glowed from an old oil drum, warming a band of the city's lost children. Chris slowed the Camaro to a stop at the alleyway. The group of transients looked up and recognized Detective Priest's car. Chris was a softy at heart, especially when it came to the homeless. He and his mother were homeless for a very short time when he was nine years old. It was only for five nights, but he would never forget what it felt like. He remembered his mother trying to beg for change in order to get Chris something to eat for that day. 
During that time, and the time afterward, they were like gypsies, moving from place to place. They had left Chris's grandparents' house in Arkansas, and had finally settled in the city of San Antonio. Michael motioned to the group to come to the car. The group of four, three older men, and one maybe around 30, walked over to Miss Sunshine with their hands in their pockets. Michael rolled down the window manually. Evening, fellas. Chris leaned in and addressed them. Hey, Chris. What are you doing out here on this cold-ass night, man? Asked one of the older men. Working. Hey, have you tried the shelters around here? It's gonna be too damn cold to sleep out here. One of the other men spoke up. Yes, sir. But they're all full up. No more room. That's a shame, said Chris. If you want, I can call a unit to come pick you up. Let you stay in the tank for the night. Leave first thing tomorrow at 6 a.m. Just to get out of the cold, guys. It's snowing. The forced older man spoke up, saying, Nah, man. Thanks. We'll be okay. We got the fire there. As he motioned to the glowing oil drum down the dark alley. Chris asked Michael, Hey, man. Would you reach behind my seat? Grab that bottle back there for me. Michael fished around for the mystery bottle behind Chris's seat, pulling out a purple suede bag with an unopened bottle of Crown Royale within. The good stuff. He presented it and looked at Chris with a questioning nod. Chris nodded back, confirming the gift to the four men. Michael handed it to them carefully. The youngest man accepted with gratitude. Thanks, guys, he said with a smile, full of rotten teeth, and presented the bottle to his buddies. The third older man reached out and said, Why don't you let me hold on to that? Keep it safe. The young man complied. Michael laughed, while Chris added, Treat her right, fellas. Stay warm. Yeah, Chris. Thanks. They waved goodbye as they made their way back to the warmth of the fire. Take care, detectives. One of the men shouted out. Michael looked at Chris, shaking his head. Chris looked back and asked him, half expecting a smart-ass answer. What? Got anything for me back there? Michael playfully asked. No, there ain't nothing back there for you. That stuff's for people like me, like those guys. You still have too much to lose.